Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, the invitation to visit Moscow again for me, my second time. And it's been a wonderful opportunity to see old friends, make new friends, and uh, provide opportunities for developing collaboration. So thank you very much. Uh, in my time this morning, uh, I'd like to discuss late effects of pediatric uh, cancer. And at the end of this session, I hope that you'll be able to appreciate the spectrum of long-term and late effects developing after cancer, the impact of late effects on duration and quality of survival, and the concept of risk-based survivor-focused care. So we know that there are many health concerns that are experienced by our survivors after their uh, experience with cancer that may impact growth and development, uh, organ function, uh, and we worry, you know, when we have developing organs and now as our survivor population is getting older, we're worrying about their organ health as they're aging. Uh, fertility and reproduction are very important issues that often are prioritized at a lower level uh, because of the concern to uh, get treatment uh, underway uh, expeditiously. Uh, our survivors, in addition to having to worry about <clears throat> recurrence of their primary cancer, may also have worries uh, related to uh, increased predisposition from treatment or uh, genetic factors for other types of, of uh, second neoplasms, uh, some of which may range from low-grade, uh, non-life-threatening to very high-grade, life-threatening uh, lesions. And uh, I can't uh, go into detail, but subsequent speakers will, about the variety of uh, psychosocial impacts of the cancer experience that may have lifelong impact on emotional health and education and vocational uh, attainment, as well as social and, and uh, interpersonal relationships. And how common are these long-term and late effects? Well, we know in looking at the childhood cancer survivor experience, and uh, this study they have evaluated the cumulative incidence of chronic physical conditions among young adult survivors in the cohort. Recall that this is a retrospective cohort of more than 10,000 survivors who are treated at uh, now over 31 institutions. In this study, they focused on the adults in the cohort. Uh, this uh, study relies on self-reported outcomes. Uh, they have to have had their cancer diagnosed before 21 years of age. The median age at this uh, assessment uh, was almost 27 years, and the median time from therapy was 17 years. And what they determine, if one looks at the cumulative incidence in relation to the years from cancer diagnosis, is that with increasing time from cancer diagnosis, you know, nearly three-fourths will report or endorse having one or at least one chronic health condition, and uh, over 40 percent of those would have one of those conditions being severe or life-threatening or even a fatal condition. So we know that this, these are very common uh, events. If we bring a cohort then back on campus to our centers and evaluate them as we have done with the St. Jude Lifetime Cohort Study, within this group we evaluated just over 1,700 survivors. Uh, they are, these are clinically assessed. We do get uh, patient reported outcomes, but these are uh, individuals coming on having laboratory evaluations and other diagnostic evaluations. Their median age at diagnosis was six years. A median uh, age at the time of their evaluation was 32 years, and time from diagnosis was 25 years, so slightly longer in follow-up. And in this cohort, when we looked at the cumulative prevalence in relation to age and years, of any chronic condition in the lighter blue versus a serious life-threatening condition, we were able to estimate that by age 45 years, nearly 90% would have at least one or more chronic health condition, and almost 81% would have a serious disabling or life-threatening chronic health conditions. So this told us that there are survivors who are clinically assessed actually had a large proportion with subclinical or non-diagnosed, uh, previously di undiagnosed disease that potent potentially could be remediated in, uh, in an effort to preserve organ function. Now, how does the impact of these uh, long-term and late conditions, how, do the, how does this impact uh, the uh, mortality of our survivors? And again, this is uh, information from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study in which they looked at the standard mortality 
uh, they looked at the uh, mortality related to uh, various events. So in relation to the blue, we're looking at uh, impact of mortality from um, the cumulative mortality from time from diagnosis. And we see that, you know, after 10, 15 years, there is a leveling off uh, of, of, of mortality related to the primary cancer. But in contrast, there is an increase in non-recurrence uh, non-external causes which relate to the, the chronic health conditions experienced by this group. And what is contributing to those most primarily are subsequent neoplasms, a more than 15-fold excess risk in our population compared to population controls, and cardiovascular disease, a more than seven-fold excess risk. The gray line represents a uh, cause of death uh, related to uh, external causes such as accidents and suicides, etc. Now, with this, this data is very sobering, but it's important to know that in tracking late health outcomes over the last 30 to 40 years, they have been a remarkable stimulus for change in pediatric cancer therapy. So our recognition of these late effects initially in young patients were focused on the physical things we were seeing as they impacted their growth and development. In the case of this young man who has uh, significant cervical and supraclavicular soft tissue hypoplasia related to having high dose radiation at a very young age. But even more so, as we have tracked survivor health and aging cohorts of childhood cancer survivors, we now see impact on organ function. Uh, so in the case of individuals who've had mediastinal or mantle radiation for Hodgkin lymphoma, one can see that we are right in the field there for the coronary arteries, and this is contributing to an increased risk of coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction as these survivors are aging. Uh, we also see uh, the recognition more and more of subsequent malignancies within this cohort as exemplified by this breast cancer in a Hodgkin lymphoma survivor. So our efforts now as we see children in our practices are continually uh, considering the long and late term effects, these conditions that are persisting or developing five or more years from cancer diagnosis, and what can we do with our efforts to control their primary cancer uh, and sustain a remission and balance that cost of cure. And I, the way that we are able to do this uh, within pediatric uh, uh, cancer treatment protocols has really changed the spectrum of late effects that we observe in our pediatric survivors as we are following them, at least within the pediatric time frame up to the, the, the second decade. We rarely see individuals presenting in our practices as pediatricians with cardiomyopathy or severe pulmonary fibrosis or high-grade second cancers. The, the exception would be those individuals who actually have fairly resistant or refractory disease that require you know, more um, intensive types of therapy. In contrast, we do still have our, uh, survivors who experience uh, a greater prevalence of of many life-altering effects, cognitive deficits, infertility, seizure disorders, low-grade second cancers, neurosensory changes, as well as other chronic symptoms such as chronic pain. And of concern, we have survivors too, as they leave our care, are uh, showing uh, a high proportion with other conditions that if we really do not address them in a timely way can have an impact and lead to uh, life-threatening events as they age. And these are conditions such as obesity and overweight and immunodeficiency, our endocrinopathies, and all the uh, other areas of subclinical organ dysfunction that have been described. So what can we do to optimize uh, survivor health as they are being followed in our practices and then leave and uh, are entering back into community practices and, uh, as older adults. Uh, we need to consider within that population the risk for specific late effects in relation to their age, gender, and race, their pre-morbid and comorbid conditions uh, for, before their cancer experience, the genetic factors, which we're learning more and more about, uh, that may not only influence why they developed cancer in the first place, but also may contribute to both acute and late uh, toxicity risk. We know that uh, the tumor factors, such as histology, site, biology, and response, directly relate to the type of treatment that is going to be required to uh, sustain that remission. And unfortunately, some survivors will have uh, life-threatening and life-altering events during treatment. It may be an infection or a coagulopathy, a stroke, et cetera, that contribute to long-term health events. 
the area of research that is uh, really uh, a big focus of, of our cohort at St. Jude is aging and the impact of aging uh, on uh, the, these more vulnerable organs uh, related to their cancer treatment. And after we have discussed all of uh, these types of issues with our survivors, we are left with what is your role to play in maintaining and preserving your health as a cancer survivor? And it comes back to uh, the, the same uh, types of issues that we all should be considering and their lifestyle issues. You know, how can we lead, a, have a healthy lifestyle that uh, eliminates tobacco and uh, adheres to a healthy diet and uses alcohol in moderation and has regular physical activity and uses measures of sun protection? So one way to do this, and this is emphasizing how we approach uh, survivor-focused risk-based care, is you have to have a, a treatment outline to understand what those health risks may be. And this treatment, uh, it, it should, this treatment summary should include the cancer histology, the involved sites, should have the age of diagnosis, the specific details of the cancer treatment, the surgeries, the chemotherapeutic agents, the radiation treatment fields and doses, the blood product transfusions, and whether uh, hematopoietic cell transplantation was required uh, as part of the therapy. And why do you need this? It's important to have all of those considered within a care plan uh, because your risk for specific late effects will vary. And I'm gonna give you some examples of this uh, shortly. Uh, this care plan should ideally be organized by the oncology clinicians. It should have that summary of the treatment. It should have a primary cancer surveillance plan, which of course becomes less and less of a concern as more time passes and we're assured of that uh, sustained remission. Uh, but the care plan at that point should focus more on cancer and cancer treatment related uh, late effects and some screening for those health risks and counseling about the lifestyle and how lifestyle may impact those cancer-related risks. At the same time, it's critically important for our survivors to be screened for the general comorbid conditions and manage those comorbid conditions that are common in our populations. And if you have a complicated survivor who perhaps might, like a brain tumor survivor who may be seeing the oncology uh, specialist, but also the neurologist and the endocrinologist, and, and as well have a primary care. It's important for everyone to be communicating and to define the roles of who's doing what to assure that there's not duplication of effort, but there's also uh, not uh, omission of screening and counseling that should be done because others are assuming uh, that another clinician is, is providing that information. And I think one of the areas that we struggle with the most you know, globally is how can we provide resources to address medical and psychosocial needs? Even in the best of uh, uh, national health care plans, sometimes it's the psychosocial issues that uh, become more challenging to address uh, and that we need to work on more, uh, even when we do have resources to address the medical issues. So I think we'll hear more about that again from other speakers. So let's talk about why you have to have this care plan. Look at all these uh, different uh, uh, presentations of childhood cancer from acute leukemia to osteosarcoma, retinoblastoma, medulloblastoma, even when you consider, for example, individuals who have the same type of uh, cancer, a Wilms tumor, uh, with metastatic pulmonary disease versus a Wilms tumor that's limited to the uh, to the the kidney, you have to recognize that treatment plans really vary based on the heterogeneity of these cancers. So you can't assume that one cancer may have the same risk for late effects. So knowing that cancer histology and the sites of involved disease is important. And the care plan, the reason age is important is that we know that age influences the risk of late effects. So for example, young patients are more vulnerable to cognitive dysfunction after central nervous system uh, irradiation, and we know that that can have remarkable impact on their educational and vocational achievement. But it's not always the young patients that may be more vulnerable for specific effects. If you are older, for example, an older woman will have a higher risk for premature ovarian insufficiency after alkylating agent chemotherapy and abdominal pelvic radiation. And the reason for this is that the woman is born with their full complement of primordial follicles at birth, and that the, that level, uh, the, the proportion will become less and less over the reproductive lifespan. So uh, women who are older at treatment are going to have a higher risk of having an earlier menopause. And so this should be uh, considered as well in treatment planning and measures to preserve fertility if they can be implemented. We know that every chemotherapy has different side effect profiles 
in the acute sense, but also in terms of, uh, of uh, late complications. And tracking the health of survivors has really been a, uh, enabled us to identify these relationships, you know, platinum and hearing loss, anthracyclines and cardiomyopathy, high-dose methotrexate and cognitive decline, uh, glucocorticoids and busulfan, a relationship with cataracts, and again, alkylating agents in relationship to infertility, and glucocorticoids again in the relationship to uh, bone and skeletal toxicity, such as osteoporosis and osteonecrosis. So knowing those specific chemotherapeutic agents really will help us define what the risk might be as that survivor is getting older. But it's not just the specific agent, it's also the chemotherapy dose that influences risk. So in this study from the Children's Oncology Group uh, that evaluated anthracycline-related heart failure, they determined in looking at the odds ratio in relation to the cumulative anthracycline exposure, the odds ratio, the risk becomes elevated beyond 100 milligrams per meter squared, but then once you exceed 250, there's an exponential risk for anthracycline-related heart failure. This type of information has really motivated uh, restriction and elimination of these types of agents in an effort to preserve cardiovascular health in our survivors. So dose is important. Uh, what about radiation? We have to consider, you know, radiation has specific target organs in the field, so you have to know what, you know, the fields are to anticipate what target organs may be impacted. For example, if there's cranial radiation, one might be considering, based on the area that's irradiated, uh, a, a risk for cognitive deficits and motor and sensory deficits. If you have uh, radiation to the endocrine uh, system, your one might be impacted, might be impacting growth, metabolism, body composition, and reproduction based on where those treatment fields are. So knowing the specific treatment fields and having that survivor understand what organs were in the treatment fields is important. But then again, it's not just the treatment, it's the dose of the radiation. So here again is another childhood cancer survivor study that looked at the risk of radiation-associated breast cancer in relation to the dose to the breast. And what they determine in evaluating the odds ratio in relation to the dose from the breast is that there is a linear relationship that increases with increasing dose. But if one considers the dose of radiation if given to the ovaries, there's also a modifying effect by ovarian radiation. If the dose to the ovaries is greater than 5 gray, which would likely ablate ovarian function, your risk of breast cancer is lower. If the dose is less, the risk of breast cancer, um, um, if, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, if, if it's greater, it's lower. If it's, if it's less, where you maintain ovarian function, your risk is higher. So this is telling us there's a hormonal influence related uh, to ovarian function that is modifying uh, the breast cancer risk after radiation to the breast. But it's not just the, the, the target organs or the dose, it's also the field. And so here's another follow-up uh, study from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study looking at the risk of breast cancer by radiation field. So here we have cumulative risk in relation to age and years, and we compare the risk of individuals treated with mantle, a field that is going to encompass neck, supracubicular, axillary, as well as mediastinal, then whole lung, all of the breasts, much larger volume, and then mediastinal radiation. So more restricted fields and restricted impact to the breast. And one can see that there really is a, a, a comparable risk in relation uh, to, to age here uh, for individuals who have whole lung. And in this study, the whole lung radiation was a median exposure of 14 gray compared to mantle radiation where the immediate exposure was 35 gray. So volume plays a large role and it's been important in influencing uh, our uh, recommendations for screening and surveillance in these young women as they are getting older. All right, let's go back to chemotherapy. Uh, one, and uh, con considering combined modality therapy, one has to also think about treatment combinations uh, and that they may have co uh, dual risk that contribute to excess toxicity. So we know chest radiation can impact cardiovascular health as well as anthracycline with those conditions listed there. And so here's another childhood cancer survivor study that evaluated clinical heart failure risk, cumulative incidence here in relation to age and years. And one can see that for individuals who had radiation involving uh, the chest potentially scattering to the heart with anthracycline, 
their uh, cumulative incidence, incidence was almost 12%. Highest risk with this combined modality therapy. Uh, subsequent, if you look at the individual exposures, less. And here, uh, the sibling uh, cumulative incidence is, is, uh, is there for comparison. So again, even as we're restricting doses, if we're using combined modality that has toxicity that's, uh, that's uh, similar to target organs, one must consider excess risks related to the combinations. In considering also uh, the, the latency or the presentation of late effects, we've looked at risk profiles and it helps you anticipate when you should be screening. And it's important to note that the time from exposure to manifestation does vary based on uh, the specific treatments. So here's some uh, specific uh, uh, modalities and therapies that we use. We know that platinum and ifosamide, for example, causes earlier acute toxicity that persists, you know, hearing loss and uh, renal tubular injury. Uh, in regards to radiation, most of these are delayed, and some may present as early as months, but really may become more manifest as that child is, is completing uh, growth and development. And, and then as we're looking at aging survivors, it's really when we begin to see this excess risk of cardiomyopathy and breast cancer. So this, this type of uh, monitoring of the natural history and understanding it helps us anticipate when our screening should be implemented uh, and when the, the prevalence becomes high enough to uh, signal a need for earlier surveillance. So I want to end with the last three examples and talk about, uh, you know, how when we are considering chronic, very common comorbid conditions, how those might impact your risk for cancer-related toxicity. So again, this is a childhood cancer survivor study where they looked at, in this case, multiple chronic uh, health con uh, chronic conditions, uh, cardiovascular uh, risk conditions, but I'm going to focus on hypertension here and the risk of congestive heart failure. Uh, this was a longitudinal evaluation, again, with over 10,000 survivors who were adults in the cohort, and they were cu curious, was the risk, if you had a condition like hypertension, additive to uh, having an exposure that was cardiotoxic. Uh, and what they determined was, uh, if you had a history of hypertension but no anthracycline exposure, your relative risk, your rate ratio for congestive heart failure was 34-fold. If you had anthracyclines but no hypertension, it was 8-fold. However, if you had hypertension and anthracycline exposure, you had an 88 fold excess risk for congestive heart failure. So the relative excess risk due to this inter interaction, 44-fold. Uh, and so this actually was a very nice illustration of hypertension potentiating anthracycline-associated risk for congestive heart failure. And within this manuscript in JCO in 2013, they actually looked at other conditions such as obesity and dyslipidemia, and I would uh, recommend to you to review that. And it just gives a very, very strong message for the importance of prevention and keeping our survivors, you know, uh, well and preserving their cardiovascular health. What about lifestyle factors? Do we have evidence that that can make a difference? Well, here again is another childhood cancer survivor study. They looked at exercise and the risk of major cardiovascular effects in over uh, 1,100 Hodgkin lymphoma survivors who were uh, 31 years of age uh, at the time of the evaluation. Their median follow-up was 12 years, and they looked at the 10-year cumulative incidence of uh, any cardiovascular event, which was 12.12% in this group, and then they looked at the impact of vigorous exercise on that cumulative incidence. So here is a figure showing cumulative incidence in relation to time since baseline, and they evaluated the cohort as to whether they met criteria for having the uh, CDC recommended uh, parameters for physical uh, exercise, rigorous physical activity. And so for individuals who met that guideline, guideline, meaning they had greater than nine metabolic equivalents, they had a lower cumulative incidence of any major cardiovascular event compared to those that did not. So this again was strong evidence for the impact of physical activity on reducing cardiovascular risk. And my last example is genetic factors. There are many, many studies that are just uh, exploding in the literature now looking at various uh, impact of uh, genetic polymorphisms and other types of genetic factors and how that might influence risk. In this case, this is a children's oncology group study that looked at the cell 4 variant and anthracycline-related cardiomyopathy. Uh, they undertook a genome-wide association study of survivors who had heart failure and who did not have heart failure, and then they looked, they identified a SNP on the cell 4 gene that passed significance for a gene-environment interaction. And what they noted was, if you had the allele 
AA or GA, your risk uh, for cardiomyopathy was infrequent and was not dose-related. However, if you had uh, the GG homozygous phenotype, you had a tenfold increased risk of cardiomyopathy compared to those who had this allele uh, and uh, those, and this was when you had anthracycline exposure that was lower, less than 300 milligrams uh, per meter squared or less. So we know that at these lower doses, you know, dose isn't very important across all TRIA cohorts, but we still see survivors who have had these low exposures and are having cardiac events, and this helps understand their vulnerability related to a genetic factor. And uh, the impact of this gene likely, uh, it, it, there's a physiologic um, um, reason that makes sense clinically. Uh, the self genes are a protein family. They, uh, they are a group of splicing regulators known to impact the TNNT2 gene that encodes for cardiac troponin T. And so they think that this is impact is through an impact on uh, cardiac uh, contractibility. And so this, uh, this is going to be uh, evaluated further in larger cohorts. But I think this is um, representative of many studies we're seeing for a variety of late effects targeting specific SNPs and other genetic factors that are helping us understand what makes survivors uh, more vulnerable. So I'll end with my take-home points. Uh, I hope you've appreciated that cancer survivors represent a growing and medically vulnerable population. Uh, Long-term and late effects reduce quality of survival and increase the risk of premature mortality. And the risk of specific long-term and late effects is directly related to the specific cancer treatments and is mediated by a variety of factors. So we had examples of all those factors. So risk-based survivor care that incorporates the routine health care and a personalized plan of surveillance and screening as well as management and prevention of late effects that are predisposed by his cancer and its treatment is recommended for all survivors. And knowledge of cancer treatment is required to optimally implement risk-based care. And it's not only our survivors, but our providers, our clinicians, should be aware of these health risks uh, after the cancer experience and the associations with treatments and help uh, provide those resources to facilitate survivors' access to risk-based care. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I don't know if we're going to do questions or wait. Thank you, Melissa, for the very uh, comprehensive coverage of the lay effects. So we may take one or two questions. Any questions from the audience? May I ask a question on the monitoring of the cardiac uh, effect of the survivors? Uh, we are in, working in the pediatric oncology departments. So when these survivors, they are in their 20s, 30s, so where they are receiving this cardiac monitoring, our pediatric cardiologists are always feeling uncomfortable to take care of these adults with those adult cardiac diseases. I think that's your, that question is one of the most challenging issues that we have because we have a transition within our pediatric age patients uh, that they need to move to medical versus pediatric facilities. Yeah. And so we have to have partnerships with subspecialists as well as primary care physicians to s sort of pick up the baton and continue with those screenings because it's not practical for every, every center to continue to see adults within, uh, within their, uh, their institutions. And so I think that groups have approached this in different ways. Some partner, like if they're in a university and they've identified colleagues who are on the medicine, uh, in, in internal medicine or family medicine who can take over. Other groups work with community physicians in transitioning that care. And then smaller centers, uh, a smaller proportion of centers actually can continue to see those adults. Mm. It's actually better to have that survivor developing a relationship with a clinician in the community because it's not practical for pediatricians to continue this type. So it, yeah. it takes a lot of education of, the, of your partners in internal medicine and family medicine. Okay, thank you. So if there's no more questions, uh, thanks, Marisa, again. <laughs>